Good day, students. This is Professor Pontificate. Your course instructor, Mr. Alberhasky, has asked that I come and elucidate some of the basic principles of narration for your benefit. Such a charming man, I could not deny his request. Now, these principles are foundational not only to understanding how stories work, but to crib a famous catchphrase from the great fictitious detective Sherlock Holmes. They are elementary, my dear Watson. The great philosopher, Rene Descartes, shifted the entire course of human thought with this famous dictum, I think, therefore I am, which postulates that the foundation of basis for human existence is recognition of said existence. Metacognition, or in other words, the ability to think about one's own process of thinking, is what makes humans unique on Earth. Should a character in a film achieve Cartesian insight, I believe it would be expressed thusly. It narrates, therefore I am. But what is this elusive it that narrates? For film has always been apt to posture itself as an unmediated discourse, as an utterance without an almighty utterer, which is why film, which is why film theorists often describe classical Hollywood technique as invisible or self-effacing. Though narration does possess attributes that we typically reserve for such a godlike entity, namely omniscience. This begs the question, what is narration? A simple definition inspired by the film scholar David Bordwell is the process by which the film's plot and style interact with one another to both cue and constrain the viewer's construction of the fabula. Now this definition needs some unpacking. It derives from the Russian formalist distinction between the plot and the fabula. The plot is simply the sequence of events. It's what we see unfold on the screen. The fabula, by contrast, is the imaginary construct that the viewer creates, both progressively and retroactively, that embodies the entire story action as a chronological cause and effect chain of events occurring within a given duration and spatial field. One obvious difference between the plot and the fabula is that the plot may be out of chronological order, whereas in the fabula we reconstruct the plot so that it adheres to chronological sequence. Furthermore, I like to think of the fabula as the entire story universe. The plot is only a fraction of the fabula. So if you'd like an analogy, here glows. The plot is to the earth, as the fabula is to the universe. Now, for example, in an initial scene, we might meet adult characters. This is on the side of the plot. But according to the laws of the fabula, these characters must have been born, endured childhood, etc., the same as all of us. The entire sum of these prior experiences are part of the fabula. Some childhood experiences might be developed later in the film, say through flashback, but of course not all will. Sequels will explore fabula material that takes place after the film is ended, whereas prequels will explore, explore fabula material that takes place prior to the film. We can deduce from this description that the, the fabula bears semblance to the world in which we live. And one pr primary basis of the fabula is that it abides by the law of verisimilitude, that it in some way is a semblance of the world we know, a semblance of reality. Even fantasy films that are set in entirely make-believe places must establish some rules that delineate the film reality from the reality that we experience. And once the viewer is made aware of the film's verisimilitude, the filmmakers must abide by those laws or risk pushing too far the viewer's willing suspension of disbelief. Uh, the film's style is how the film uses uh, filmic technique, things such as narrative elements, as well as those of mise-en-scene, cinematography, editing, and sound, to develop both material and gaps. The material, quite simply, is what the viewer sees on the screen, the characters, the setting, the action, any and all of the visual and acoustic elements of the film. Though it may be possible, it would be tedious in the extreme for a filmmaker to film the entire fabula of a film's plot. For instance, because of the laws of verisimilitude, we understand that characters are prone to sleep eight hours a night. Now, we need not bear witness to eight straight hours of sleep to know that a character has slept the night through. A filmmaker may accomplish such an action by first showing a character getting into bed, setting her alarm clock. Then, the filmmaker may cut in one fashion or another to uh, the alarm clock blaring loudly, the character reaches out of bed and shuts it off. In terms of material, these two shots have only taken up a couple of seconds of screen time, but because of the gap created between shot one and shot two, the viewer infers that eight hours have elapsed. 
in fabula time. Another way to think about the distinction between the plot and fabula is a plot is what's visible on the screen, whereas the fabula is what the viewer creates in his or her mind based on the images on the screen. In our example, the viewer must fill in the gap created between shot one and shot two to believe the character has slept straight hour, eight straight hours without interruption. The natural assumption would be that nothing important to the development of the plot occurred during those eight hours. And such an inference is encouraged by the continuity of the cut. As a character gets out of bed, she might feel well rested, get on with her day, etc. This type of gap is called a suppressed gap in the narration because it elides time without any signal to the viewer that he or she has missed important information. Now such a, a gap is highly economical as you might see uh, because we don't have to watch a character sleep for straight hours but also the filmmakers don't want the viewer constantly wondering about what happens between shot one and shot two and a suppressed gap encourages the viewer to say nothing important happened between shot one and shot two. The audience should give their energy rather to uh, constructing the fabula based on new material offered by the next shot. Now a suppressed gap in the narration may set a viewer up for surprise later down the road when we, in a flashback we cut back to that gap, open it up, and learn that in fact something important of the plot did actually occur. For example, perhaps we learn later in the film that at two in the morning our character woke up, prone to somnambulism, she got up and slept walk over to her bedside table where she pulled out a gun, entered her neighbor's apartment, and shot and killed him. Now the viewer would be surprised because the suppressed gap had encouraged the viewer to infer that nothing important happened when in fact the filmmaker had set up the viewer to make an erroneous inference. A second type of gap in the narration is called a flaunted gap. Now remember in the suppressed gap the viewer does not know there is important information that he or she does not know. So a suppressed gap is an unknown unknown. Conversely, in a flaunted gap, the viewer knows there's important information that he or she does not know. By contrast, it is a known unknown. Thus, one distinction between a suppressed and a flaunted gap uh, is the viewer's awareness or ignorance of vital information elided from the plot, the knowledge of which may or may not be necessary for the construction of a clear and coherent fabula. To illustrate, in the detective film, the initial scene may contain a murder in which some of the rules of shot reverse shot editing are violated to conceal the murderer's face. That is, in the first shot, we may see a victim looking at something off screen. Um, in the reverse shot, instead of seeing the killer's face, as the rules of shot reverse shot editing would dictate, we see instead a close up of a knife. In the third shot, we see the victim being stabbed, and then the scene quickly fades out. Now the filmmaker has created a flaunted gap in the narration by depicting a murder but withholding a vital piece of information, the killer's face. So whereas the suppressed gap may delay a surprise down the road, the flaunted gap immediately creates curiosity and suspense. Who killed that poor man? And when the detective enters the scene in the subsequent shot, of course a question will become, will the killer strike again before the detective finds him? But now we are in the terrain of the complication, a topic we'll explore in a different lecture. For now, this is Pro Professor Pontificate signing off. In the meantime, do not bother me with your questions while I will be engaged in the life of the mind. Instead, please qu consult your course instructor, Mr. Albert Husky, a very kind and benevolent man. He'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you have.